Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, will an Oscar-nominated documentary finally force Pakistan to confront honour killings? Also, we talk to Amnesty International's Louise Carr on the perils of being a woman refugee. And the world is your oyster, how one French high school trains girls for jobs often filled by men. But first, the harrowing tale of a young Pakistani woman surviving an honour killing is the subject of a new documentary nominated for this year's Oscars. It's led to an unprecedented debate in the conservative male-dominated Muslim nation. As a result, Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif says he will now back a law to end a legal loophole for the accused. Shot in the head by her own father and uncle, after running away to marry someone deemed unsuitable. Sabo was put in a sack and thrown into a river, her attackers unaware that their bullet had missed her brain. But she managed to break out of the bag, crawl out of the water and find help. Sabo was found in hospital soon after by documentary maker Charmin Shinoy. A survivor of such an ordeal is extremely rare, so both women were keen to tell the tale to the world in a bid to change attitudes and laws in Pakistan, where those who carry out honour killings are rarely punished and often given extra respect by their community. You can go into small towns and villages across Pakistan and you will find that people will think that honour killing is not a crime because nobody ever goes to jail for it. So I wanted to start a national discourse about honour killings because people need to realise that it is a very serious crime. It is not something that is part of our religion or our culture and this is something that should be treated as premeditated murder and people should go to jail for it. Honour killings are an all too familiar story in Pakistan. The government puts figures at around a thousand cases a year. However, many instances go unreported and unofficial estimates are much higher at around three to four thousand. As the law currently stands, those who commit these killings are acquitted if their family forgives them. The documentary shows Saba being put under immense pressure to forgive her father and uncle who then avoid punishment. To see how much pressure there can be applied in a low socio income background in Pakistan is incredible because these people would tell them that next time you need something and you come to the neighborhood, we will not give you anything. So they ostracized Sabah's in-laws and her family and she was forced to forgive. That's what surprised me most, that how much pressure that exists and this loophole in our law <coughs> allows the pressure to continue. The film has already had some impact. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif praised it and vowed to eradicate honour killings. He said he would back a 2014 bill that would put a stop to the legal loophole of forgiveness. But some, like Human Rights Watch, say more must be done to stop police standing back and allowing the killings to happen and to provide safe shelters. Moving on, and Amnesty International has just released its annual report. The organisation says governments are failing miserably when it comes to upholding human rights, with the UN also doing little about it. Nowhere is this more apparent than with the Syrian conflict and the resulting refugee crisis. And as we've reported in the past here on the 51%, most vulnerable are women and children as hundreds of thousands seek refuge in Europe. Joining me in the studio today is Louise Carr, a campaigner with Amnesty International based in Paris. Louise, thanks so much for joining us. Let's start with that very hard-hitting report, which includes a huge variety of allegations directed towards many governments and countries and, and of course, many directly affecting women. What are the most pressing issues? Yeah. So our report documents a series of violations that are that are taking place against men, women and children. Um, among the those affecting women in priority we have um, honour killing, honour crimes, we have um, sexual violence, whether that's um, against people who are on a migration route or perpetrated by um, armed groups like the Islamic State. Also we have a number of discrimination against women where in terms of um, rights of divorce, rights 
rights to to um, to inher in inheritance rights. So we ha we see that women are increasingly falling victim to human rights abuses. But what's important to remember is that women are not just vulnerable by nature. They are vulnerable to specific violences because the authorities are failing to take into account their specific needs in legislation. So we have legal gaps and then also sometimes the legislation is in place but in practice there is no protection for women in, in against these violations. And this is 2015? This is 2015 and, and what we see now, if, if we look at all the violations, all the armed conflicts that are that are happening, all the attacks that are taking place against civilian populations, this is the reason why in 2015 we had the refugee crisis. People are forced to flee their homes because they have to flee it's either war or, or persecution, which is putting these people in increasingly vulnerable situations because they don't have any safe and legal means to be able to come to safety. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about that refugee crisis here in Europe. I mean, we saw uh, in the middle of 2015 enormous numbers of people heading towards uh, the continent and uh, not surprisingly, as the year pressed on, more and more of them were women. And of course, the reality is that they are more vulnerable to sexual exploitation and violence. They're more vulnerable because there is no protection in place for them. So, and we need governments to act. They can act in two ways. They can act ahead of this crisis, even, even before it begins. People who, the refugees who are based in, if we take Syria, for example, in the in the uh, neighbouring countries of Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, they, there are ways to, to allow them to come to safety without having to put their lives at risk. So you have resettlement, you have family unification, you have um, asylum visas. There are many different ways, but these these methods are not being used by governments. Also, once they arrive, we have a human humanitarian crisis in Europe. At the moment, what happens, um, what should happen is that if you have centres, if you have um, reception centres for refugees, you could, uh, women and men and women could be separated. Um, the to uh, toilet and shower facilities would be well lit. They would be separated from men. We wouldn't have the situation that we have now of women and men um, who are forced to live in, in these centres. So, so, so you, you, you're saying there's a need for segregated facilities as a result? Well, there's a need for for the specific um, needs of women and children to be taken into account when they're on these irregular routes through Europe. They have no protection. The borders are being closed. They're open again. They're being closed. It's uh, they're they're in a, a constant state of of instability. And what we've sh shown recently is that um, in. Uh, we, we highlighted the violence of that, that women face at the hands of smugglers, at the hands of security guards, and also of other other refugees with, with whom they're they're travelling. When it comes to smugglers, often you'll have people who will say, "You can have a discount on your on on the fare to that that you have to pay in exchange for sex." Um, security guards who take advantage of the fact that the women ca are in a vulnerable situation, that they can't complain if, if there's any um, because they're desperate people, aren't they? We need to think about these these people as. There are people who make the choice to live. They've decided to leave their country because it's, it's, unbear it's unbearable for them. They, nobody makes this choice easily. So, and what we're doing is by forcing them to take these routes, we are, we are increasing their, their, their vulnerability. And this is something we need to think about. All they're looking for is a safe place, a place where they can find stability to rebuild their lives, to carry on, carry on as before, find jobs, let their children go to school. And at the moment, they're spending months, if not years, on asylum routes. Louise Carr, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So, why can't a woman be a welder or a builder? It's a question young girls tend not to ask themselves, but a high school in France is challenging those cultural norms. It's offering vocational training for jobs usually performed by men. Feminine from head to toe. Amanda is a factory technician apprentice. She's the only girl in her class, but that doesn't bother her one bit. I did an internship in this company when I was a sophomore, and I really liked it, so I applied, and here I am. We use many different techniques, and that's my thing. Adlin's thing is wood, but she needed to convince her parents it was the right career. At first they were very surprised and they weren't really okay with it, but after talking about it they accepted the idea, and today they're quite happy. The high school Kessler Guiton in western France has launched an employment equity program to encourage women to come work in male-dominated industries. This year there are 10 of them in the construction sector alone. When it comes to plumbers and electricians, there are very few girls. This program is important because bringing in girls will improve the atmosphere in the classroom. Also, some girls would like to do these kind of jobs, but they're too shy to apply. And it's a shame because all jobs are accessible to women. 
Marielle Belliard-Carrel was a truck driver for more than 20 years. Today she's a driving instructor and wants to show high school students they can see past stereotypes. I want them to choose their future job not according to their gender, but according to who they are and what they really want. I want them to abandon all the stereotypes they might have so that they won't let anybody tell them something is not possible. Because today everything is possible. It's only a question of will. The high school Kessler Guiton has started holding an annual open day for girls in the region to enable them to see what these supposedly male dominated jobs are all about. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24, full stop 51% hyphen France 24. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please keep those comments coming in. So until our next program, bye for now.